we think of the book of Revelation and we think of the future, but sometimes we don't think that Revelation is one of the great worship books in all the Bible. And the text that you just heard, uh, sung by our quartet plus one beautiful lady, is a text from the book of Revelation where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So would you turn this morning to Revelation chapter 4 as we continue our journey through the last book in the Bible. Today's message is on the throne of God. And really, I want to take two weeks and talk about the throne of God. The sermon this week, and then next week is Mother's Day, and the following Sunday, the second message on the throne of God. Our scripture is chapter 4, verses 1 through 4 in the book of Revelation. After these things I looked... And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. When John receives this vision from Jesus and writes it down, John himself is a senior adult, minimum of 85 years of age, maximum of perhaps 95 or even 98 years of age. He is imprisoned on the island of Patmos because he refused to say three little words. Caesar is Lord. In Greek, that sentence is two little words, Kaiser, Curios. To refuse to say those words was considered by the Roman government to be traitorous rebellion. The government could have sentenced John to prison, maybe because, or to death, but maybe because of his age, they sentenced him to prison instead. I'm wondering, would you be willing to die or go to jail by refusing to say two little words? How do you think John feels exiled to Patmos, maybe laboring in the mines on that island, separated from the churches and the friends that he loved? probably no family remaining. His circumstances physically are very demeaning and very painful. The Lord has revealed to him a message for seven churches on the mainland. One of these churches is leaving its first love. Another of these churches is suffering persecution. Another is becoming married to the world. Yet another is spiritually dead and doesn't know it. Still another is lukewarm and the Lord is displeased with that church. Beyond all of that, as John looks around, it seems like evil is winning and good is defeated. Those are his circumstances. When Jesus breaks in and gives him a vision of the throne of God. If your circumstances today, as you look at your life, as you look at circumstances around you, as you look at the world in which we all live, if you feel overwhelmed, 
What you really need is a vision of the throne of God. Throne is one of the key words in the book of Revelation. You find it 12 times in chapter 4 and 37 times in the entire book. The throne of God means that God rules in the universe. It is the throne of God which is supreme authority, not the thrones of human beings. Now the Bible teaches that over and over again. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18, And Micaiah the prophet said, I saw the Lord sitting on His throne, and all the host of heaven standing on His right and on His left. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 7, But the Lord abides forever. He has established His throne for judgment. Again in Psalms 47, 8, God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. And yet again, from the 103rd Psalm, the 19th verse, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah wrote, I saw the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. So I want to challenge you, above all of your suffering, above all of your prosperity, above all your circumstances, above the conditions in the world, to see that God is still on His throne, that God is sovereign. God has all power. God rules in the lives of nations, and God rules in the lives of human beings. Now, there are three parts of the vision that we've read this morning. First of all, an invitation to the throne in verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. That opening phrase, after these things, is important. Remember that back in chapter 1, verse 19, the risen Christ, in speaking to John, outlines in advance the book of Revelation. Jesus says, write down the things which you have seen, the vision of the exalted Christ in the first chapter, and the things which are the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3, and the things which shall be hereafter, the Greek, metatauta, after these things. So John has written down his vision in chapter 1, the things which he has seen. He has written down the things which are the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Now notice how chapter 4, verse 1 begins, metatauta, after these things I saw. And again, at the end of the verse, I will show you what must take place after these things. So John has a new vision, and he's going to see what happens after the seven churches and after the church age in which we live. He hears a voice. He identifies it as the first voice that he heard back in chapter 1. He tells us it was the voice like a trumpet, a strong voice, a clear voice, a mighty voice, an unmistakable voice. The trumpet in the ancient day was used for two purposes. It was used to communicate military commands, and it was used to summon the people to come and to worship God. So John hears that voice, and the voice says, Come up here, 
and I'm going to show you the things which shall be after these. An invitation to the throne. Many Bible scholars see in these verses a picture of foreshadowing of the rapture of the church when God calls His church home to heaven. The churches have been described in chapters 2 and 3. The church age has passed. And then God says, come up. And John, representing the saints, goes into heaven. And you do not read of the church anymore in the book of Revelation until you get to chapter 19 and the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is great tribulation on the earth, but the church has disappeared. And the voice which calls John up to heaven is like the voice of a trumpet. And the Bible identifies the trumpet with the calling home of God's church, the rapture of the church into glory. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. The word mystery in the Bible does not mean something we can't understand. The Greek word musterion means something previously hidden, but now unveiled. Something God has now revealed. What is the mystery? Paul continues, We shall not all sleep. Not every Christian is going to die. But we shall all be changed. Whether you die or don't die, your body's going to be changed. You'll be given a resurrection body. He writes again, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's how fast it will happen. The twinkling of an eye is not the blinking of an eye. It's quicker than that. The blinking of an eye is quick, but the twinkling of an eye is just when you speak my name and my eye communicates, I know who this is. My eye turns to look at you. That's the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, there's the trumpet again. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. That means in their resurrection bodies, no longer subject to decay and death. And we shall be changed. We receive our resurrection bodies. So John received an invitation to come up into heaven. One day the whole body of the Lord Jesus Christ some of those bodies are in the ground. Some of those bodies will still be living when Christ returns. The whole body of Christ, the church, will receive an invitation to come up into heaven. An old hymn talks about that. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, may I thy consolation share till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height, I view my home and take my flight. This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. What about our loved ones, and we all have them, who have gone on and who are now with Christ? Jesus is coming back, and he's going to raise them. What about us if we're still on this earth when Christ comes again? Jesus is coming back, and he's going to change us. So John 
has now seen three doors. In chapter 3, verse 8, the Lord says to the church at Philadelphia, I've set before you an open door. That's the door of service. In chapter 3, verse 20, the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the door of Jesus knocking at the door of the human heart. And now in chapter 4, verse 1, I see a door opened in heaven and I hear a voice come up here, an invitation to the throne. One day you're going to receive an invitation to the throne. Are you ready to respond? Now the second part of the vision concerns the glory of God on the throne in verses 2 and 3. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. John says, I was in the Spirit. Now some of our Pentecostal friends look at that and say that means John was in an ecstatic experience. An experience in which maybe he spoke in tongues. He was in the Spirit. By the way, when you hear the word Pentecost, don't think about speaking in unknown tongues. You look at Acts chapter 2, which is the day of Pentecost, and you will see not one reference to unknown tongues. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, the disciples preached and the Bible lists people from 14 regions of the world that were present in Jerusalem and heard those sermons and each one heard in his own native language. These were not ecstatic, unknown, heavenly languages. When you use the word Pentecostal, you should be thinking about known foreign languages. And how important are tongues to God? Jesus our Lord never spoke in tongues one time. In the 14th through the 16th chapters of John's Gospel, Jesus promises the coming of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 16 and 17, how many times does Jesus mention speaking in tongues? Not one. So when John says, I was in the Spirit, that's not what he means. He means I was under the control of the Holy Spirit. And that's to be the posture of the Christian every day of your pilgrimage upon the earth. And I saw a throne in heaven and one sitting upon the throne. The one sitting upon the throne is God the Father. How do I know that? Because later on in chapter 4, John writes about the seven lamps before the throne in reference to God the Holy Spirit. Later on in the same vision in chapter 5, the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, approaches the throne and takes a scroll from the one on the throne. So I conclude that the one seated on the throne is God the Father. How does John describe the appearance of God the Father? Sometimes the Bible uses what we call anthropomorphisms to describe God. That's describing God in human terms to communicate with the human mind. For example, the scripture says, the eye of the Lord is in every place beholding the good and the evil. The Bible says the ear of the Lord is open to the cry of his servants. The Bible says, who has an arm like God? So the Bible uses human terms sometimes 
to describe God. Anthropomorphisms, but not here. Instead, God looks like the brilliant colors of precious gems, the jasper, in Bible times a clear stone, perhaps a diamond, the sardius, a ruby red stone, the emerald, a brilliant green. The point is, the majesty of God, the splendor of God, the light of God, the glory of God, the glory of God upon the throne. Now watch it carefully. A throne stands for sovereignty and government and justice and power. But what does John see around the throne? A rainbow. And the rainbow speaks of mercy. It speaks of promise. It speaks of covenant. The rainbow takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 9 after God had destroyed life on earth through a flood. And God said to Noah, I set my bow in the clouds as a token of my covenant that I will never again send this kind of flood and destroy the earth again. The throne, but the mercy of God. You say, I can't see the mercy of God. My friend was involved in this tragic automobile accident and may never walk again. I can't see the mercy of God. My husband, my wife, my child, my parent suddenly ripped away from me in death. I can't see the mercy of God. In my monetary life, in my work life, it's one tragedy and one disaster after another. We see the mercy of God here by faith. And we claim the promise of God in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. But in heaven, we will see the mercy of God as the rainbow all around the throne. We will not just see the mercy of God by faith. We will see the mercy of God by sight. We will not have to look at all these disasters and tragedies and sufferings and by faith say, God has a purpose. In heaven, we will see the purpose and we will experience firsthand the mercy of God. Fanny Crosby wrote so many of the great hymns. Jesus, keep me near the cross was one of them. Rescue the perishing was another one. Fanny Crosby was blind. And one day a person said to her, you must be very sad about being blind. She said, no, I'm not sad about it. This is the way that God made me and he must have a purpose in it. And the man said, Fanny, still, even if God had a purpose, you must be sad. She said, no, I am glad. And the reason is that one day in heaven I'm going to see. And when I see, the first face I ever look upon will be the face of one who died for me, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is the glory of the one who is on the throne. Mighty, majestic, powerful, eternal, but eternal in mercy. The glory of God upon the throne. Then the third part of the vision in verse 4, the people of God around the throne. And around the throne were 24 other thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Now you'll pick up some 
commentaries and read, and the author will say, these 24 elders around the throne were angels. I don't believe so. Nowhere else in all the Bible do you read about angels sitting on thrones. Nowhere else in all the Scripture do you read about angels wearing crowns. One chapter later in chapter 5, the elders join in the song and they sing, You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Angels haven't been redeemed to God by His blood. These elders are the people of God. And the giveaway is the number 24. The whole people of God. In the Old Testament, 12 tribes. In the New Testament, 12 apostles. All the people of God are going to be there. Notice they're going to be clothed in white garments. White stands for purity. They've been washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Notice that before the throne, they're going to be wearing crowns. Jesus wore a crown of thorns that you and I might wear crowns of gold. 24, all the people of God are going to be there. Abraham and Moses and David and Daniel, all the people of God are going to be there. Matthew, John, James, and Peter, all the people of God are going to be there. Luther, Calvin, Spurgeon, Wesley, Whitfield, all the people of God are going to be there your sainted father or mother or brother or sister or husband or wife. All the people of God are going to be there. The question is, are you going to be there? There was in 1985 an actress named Geraldine Pace who won an Oscar for her role in the film Return to Bountiful. And it's the story about an ailing widow who determined that she would return to the small town where she grew up. And when she came back and stood before the people, Organ music is playing gently, quietly in the background. Secular film, organ playing, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Well, at some point, we have all wandered away from God. God is standing there. The Lord Jesus, his nail-pierced hands outstretched, and he's saying, would you come home? Would you come home today? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the glorious reality that our loved ones stand before the throne of God in heaven and thank you for the wonderful promise a promise as sure as God himself 
that those who trust Christ will be before the throne in heaven. Father, I pray that each one would speak and say yes to the voice of the Holy Spirit today. If there is a decision you want us to make, help us to respond to your invitation and come to you on earth so that we might come to you before the throne in glory. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing our hymn of invitation and invite you to come. Come trusting Christ as your Savior, responding to God's appeal come home. Maybe you've done that, but you want to come and join the church today. We invite you to come and join by baptism or by transferring your membership. Come in rededication of your life and your heart to doing God's will. He's calling. You come. Let's sing together.